Hello, Mike. Thank you. And hello to you. Welcome to another edition of Broken Bread. This is BibleBase.com's series of Bible studies, and currently we're studying a book that I wrote some years ago, The Better Covenant. So we've called this The Better Covenant, A Study Guide. I'm not sure whether this is working out as a study guide, but you can write to me and tell me what you think. We've established the fact that the covenant is foundational and central to all Old Testament scriptures. They are, in truth, the Old Covenant scriptures. Inside the most holy shrine of the nation, there stands a gold-plated trunk that contains the two tablets of stone that Jehovah had inscribed with his own finger. By its side lay the Book of the Covenant, the nation's copy of the law and statutes that they had signed up to, written in the handwriting of Moses. We have seen, too, that Jehovah provided a maintenance element of the covenant in the covenant of Levi, the priestly covenant. The priests being responsible for the safekeeping of the covenant documents and their propagation, they were responsible for teaching at that time what God had entrusted to the nation, the oracles of God. They're referred to as this priesthood, this covenant with them, in the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Covenant Scriptures. Malachi chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. And you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant may be with Levi, saith Jehovah of hosts. My covenant was with him, of life and peace, and I gave them to him that he might fear, and he feared me, and stood in awe of my name. The Lord of truth was in his mouth, and unrighteousness was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned many away from iniquity. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the Lord at his mouth, for he is the messenger of Jehovah of hosts. That was the commission that God gave to the sons of Aaron and to the Levites in general. Um, they had a job to do, and those who were of the inner family of Aaron, uh, they were the priests and the high priest and his sons. There's a reference there to him, the priesthood, being the messenger of Jehovah of hosts. This is a play on words because the name Malachi actually means my messenger. And this messenger, my Malachi, my messenger Malachi, is reminding my messenger, the priests, of their commission, of that that was entrusted to them by God. And actually he's reminding them too of their utter failure in it to such a degree that in the first chapter you hear this groan from the heart of God. Oh, that someone would close the doors, he says. So there was the Levitical covenant. We see too that Jehovah entered into a dynastic covenant with the house of David. There are many covenants associated with David. In fact, there are many covenants in the Bible. One of the most famous ones, of course, is the covenant that Jonathan made with David. First Samuel 18 and verse 3, Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he, that's Jonathan, loved him, that's David, as his own soul. And then, a little bit later on, Jonathan asks to expand that covenant, so that it's not just between Jonathan and David, but it's between Jonathan and David's families, their descendants. So it's with Jonathan and his descendants, and they too made a covenant before Jehovah, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. And then later, 
Abner, who had been one of the leaders of the other side of Saul's family, said to David, I will arise and go and will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thy soul desireth. And David sent Abner away, and he went away in peace. But there was conspiracy in the camp, and Abner was assassinated by one of David's nephews. And then later it says in Second Samuel chapter 5, So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them in Hebron before Jehovah, and they anointed David king over Israel. So David is now the popular choice. He's the man that God has chosen. He's the man that the people have chosen. And they gather to this place and they make a covenant. David made a covenant with them. David committed himself to them. And they anointed David king over Israel. What we're looking at tonight are transitions. The two transitions and no doubt other transitions as well. Transitions can be dangerous times. It's that It's that moment when the baton changes hands in the relay race. Many a relay race is lost at that moment because the the transition doesn't take place properly. The Romans were very nervous about transitions. They were suspicious of doors where you made a transition from one room to another. They were suspicious of of years, where you made a transition from the old to the new, and they had a god, Janus, after whom we have our month January, and they tried to appease him. But you don't need to be afraid of transitions. In fact, there's a verse in the Psalms which says, they had no changes. You might even put transitions. They have no transitions, therefore they fear not the Lord. There's something about the status quo that can be a real enemy to God's ongoing purposes, and uh, we need to be ready uh, to move and not get stuck with what God said yesterday. But listen to what he's saying today. We'll see an example of that in a moment. Let's have a look at the transition from theocracy, that's the rule of God, to monarchy. That's the rule by one person. Let's have a look at the times of the judges. Before the transition to monarchy, the covenant nation had a a more direct form of theocracy, that rule by God. It was a continuation of Jehovah being king in Jeshurun, as we saw in the last study. But the move to monarchy was a downward step. Some Bible scholars refer to the period of the judges as the charismatic period of Israel's history. That's not the modern use of the word charismatic, but it's a way of describing that Israel's rule came through men and women who were uniquely endowed with specific enabling by a rush of the Spirit of Jehovah upon them. That's the word that's used in this little list of uh, verses I have here, if you're using the notes, in Judges and in Samuel, several times It says the Spirit of the Lord came on or something like that. But the verb was actually rushed upon. There's there's a kind of, it's a violent word. There's energy in it. Something happened to individuals and they became equipped to be God's deliverer, God's judge for the current crisis. Or sometimes you get the statement that the Spirit of God clothed them. That's how it says in the story of Gideon. In Judges chapter 6, verse 34, it says, The Spirit of Jehovah came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer gathered together after him. But that little phrase, the Spirit of Jehovah came upon Gideon, this time is actually the Spirit of Jehovah clothed himself with Gideon. He put on Gideon like a coat (laughs) to go to battle for the people of Israel. It was a thrilling time. It was a hairy time, as we say over here in the UK. That's to say it was edgy. It was very much hand-to-mouth. 
it was essential that they depend upon God. Otherwise, disaster was around the next corner. If you want to have a look at the way in which the differences of the Spirit empowering people can be expressed, there's a digging deeper section in the notes that you might profit from. It's a bit technical, so if you find it bogging you down, don't hesitate, just close it up and move on to the next paragraph. Uh, The story is found in the book of Samuel. Prior to having kings, Israel had judges. And judges were these individuals whom God raised up at times of particular danger to lead the people in the wars of self-defense and further conquest, it would have been. It created a cyclic pattern. The covenant nation abandoned its covenant, and although God allowed them to continue in the land, they could not really enjoy it as real tenants. Other nations controlled them and exacted tribute, fines, and taxes from them that crippled the development of the nation of Israel. In their distress, they called on their covenant God, and in his covenant mercy, God intervened by raising up a judge. Again and again, that same cycle. These judges had their roots in particular family tribes, but they drew other family tribes into their bands, and the foreigners were overthrown. In the prosperity that followed, the covenant nation generally relaxed its keeping of the covenant, and God gave them into the control of yet another foreign oppressor. And so the wheel turned another revolution. The solution to the nation's need was staring them in the face. All they had to do was to turn to God and keep the covenant. God would have kept the oppressors at bay. But as so often with human beings, they decided that the solution was to change the method. Beware, brothers and sisters, of changing the method when you're stuck It may be that you need to go back before you can go forwards and that what you were doing was the right thing all along. A man named Ian Bounds wrote a book called Power Through Prayer and in his first paragraph he he has this uh, powerful statement. He says, Men are seeking for better methods. God is seeking for better men. Instead of this hand-to-mouth dependence upon God, why not be like the other nations and have someone who would take the responsibility of leading, carrying the responsibility on his own shoulders? Hence the choice, during the time of Samuel, the last of the judges, to opt for a king and to be, tragically, like the other nations. The nation of Israel had a kind of a fault line that would ultimately result in two nations. We'll see that later. At this time, that fault line was already there apparent, and there was the makings of a civil war between Saul and David. Ultimately, after Saul's death, David brought both of those groupings together under his personal rule. It was a great time and marked the greatest fulfillment to date of the covenant nation's control of its own destiny and its own leasehold land. The civil war rumbled on for a while, but finally the whole nation rallied to David and proclaimed him the king. This is in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verses 1 following. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David unto Hebron, and spake, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. That's to say family. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was thou that led us out and brought us in Israel. And Jehovah said to thee, Thou shalt be shepherd of my people Israel, and thou shalt be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them in Hebron, before Jehovah, and they anointed David king over Israel. So, 
David was their choice, and David made a covenant with them. He accepted their invitation to be their king. So he's God's choice, and now he's the people's choice. And they anointed David king over Israel. In all, David reigned for about 40 years, and his reign became the golden age in the memory of the nation. This is important. The idea of David reigning over a united nation will enter into the nation's psyche and will become part of the language through which God will convey deeper concepts. Let's have a think about the monarchy under David. If we think through some of the implications of the scriptural record, we will see another transition during this time. It's the transition from tabernacle to temple and to a vastly more complex pattern of services with instrumental music and choirs. In fact, the monarchy began at a time of priestly dysfunction. The ancient ritual of Yom Kippur, you remember the day of propitiation or atonement, required that an animal or animals be sacrificed on the prescribed altar, and that the blood of these animals be sprinkled on the propitiatory or mercy seat. However, decades before David came to the throne, the sacred Ark of the Covenant had been lost in battle, and when it returned, it was not brought back to the now permanently now settled tabernacle, but remained separated from the tabernacle and the rest of the priestly functions. It would seem that for the latter part of Samuel's time as judge and high priest, and the whole of Saul's reign, and most of David's reign, more than a hundred and twenty years and all, Yom Kippur had not been undertaken in the proper manner. For this period the sacrificial altar and the Ark of the Covenant had been separated by some twenty miles. No animal blood had been sprinkled on the propitiatory. No scapegoat had carried away all the sins of the nation. There had been no authentic day of propitiation for more than a century. David had a plan. He was meditating, thinking. <laughs> he was an active character, David, a man of tremendous abilities in all kinds of realms. And he had a thought, and he made a decision. He was going to build a house fit for God, where the altar of sacrifice and the Ark of the Covenant can be brought back together into proximity. Then Yom Kippur would be able to be undertaken authentically. He's conscious that the Ark of God is still under canvas, and he is living in his plush palace that has been provided for him by a heathen king. This is the account of the building of the temple. It's instructive in many ways, especially as a revelation of the character of David, but we will not pause to study that here. David had a desire from God to build a temple worthy of God's greatness. He received from God, the plans for the design of a magnificent building. He accumulated from God, God-given victories, a fabulous store of materials and funds to build the temple. He received encouragement from a prophet of God to build the temple. What could possibly go wrong? And then God said, no. It's a mark of David's greatness that we won't go into now. But the way he responds to this reversal of all his hopes and plans is magnificent. Not, not a trace of criticism, of distress, only a rejoicing in the fact that when God said no, he actually said yes to something even more amazing. 
When God says no, never forget this wise counsel that comes through the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8, following, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith Jehovah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, and giveth seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. So God said no, but even as God is saying no, he brings a promise that captures David's heart and imagination. Listen to Second Samuel chapter 7. Listen to Second Samuel chapter 7 verses 8 to 17. This is God's word to Nathan. Now therefore thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, I took thee from the sheepcoat, from following the sheep, that thou shouldst be prince over my people, over Israel. And I have been with thee whithersoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and I will make thee a great name, like unto the name of the great ones that are in the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as at the first. And as from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, you see, judges was God's idea. As from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I will cause thee, that's David, this is where the message is going to, I will cause thee to rest from all thine enemies. Moreover, Jehovah telleth thee, that Jehovah will build thee a house. This is what we call turning the tables, isn't it? David wants to build a house for God. He's got green lights all the way. And then just as he's ready to launch out on the project, he gets a red one. God says, no, you're not going to build the house. And he turns the tables. And David, he says, Moreover, Jehovah telleth thee that Jehovah will make thee a house. David says, I want to build a house for God. God says, no, but I'll build you a house. When thy days are fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee that he that shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And then referring, obviously, to Solomon and other descendants of David. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my loving kindness, that's my kesed covenant love, my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thy house and thy kingdom shall be made sure for ever before thee. Thy throne shall be established for ever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Thy throne shall be established for ever. Can you hear? Isaiah echoing those words and of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Not just no end to the kingdom, but no end to the expansion of the kingdom, and of the spread of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Sometimes, you see, no is better than yes. David's house for God would have been a physical temple, but God's house for David is the promise of a dynasty that will last forever. In fact, 
It's more than a promise. It's a covenant later in the history of the nation. When the Davidic dynasty was under threat, we have it spelled out very clearly. It refers to Jehoram. Now, Jehoram had some troublesome in-laws. His wife was the daughter of Ahab and presumably the daughter of Jezebel. Mm. Be careful of the family you marry into. Jehoram was thirty and two years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, for he had the daughter of Ahab to wife, and he did that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah. How be it? Jehovah would not destroy the house of David because of the covenant that he had made with David. And as he promised to give a lamp to him and to his children always. Second Chronicles 21 verse 5. So, together now with the idea of the United Kingdom under David, we have the idea of a never-ending United Kingdom under the Divinic dynasty. And this is yet another colour added to our artist's palette. We have now three interconnected covenants operating at the same time, and then, often hidden, one that continues out of sight. The Sinai covenant, the Levitical covenant, and the Davidic covenant became intertwined, interdependent, interlinked. However, the original covenant with Abraham and his seed continued unseen working its way through amazing roots to the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Abraham, the son of David. So we shall need to tread carefully as we try to copy these ideas onto a larger canvas. To go back to our old illustration, each of these covenants will provide different colours on God's palette to enable the painting of a stunning scene but we still have some more need of some more colours before that painting can be completed. These last two or three studies have actually been based on chapter 7 of the Better Covenant, which ends with this little summary. In chapter 7 of the Better Covenant, we saw the link between the Sinai Covenant and the land of Israel. We saw that the people of Israel only ever had a tenancy agreement and never owned the land freehold. We saw the way that the Sinai Covenant began to function as a tenancy agreement and the threat of losing the land if the tenancy agreement was breached. And we saw the addition of yet another covenant, the Sinai Covenant, and another covenant, the Davidic Covenant of Monarchy, And we added them to our artist's palette in preparation for a final masterpiece. Can you wait? Well, while you're waiting, be sure to reread some of these notes if you have them, or re-listen. These uh, studies are really very dense, I hope in a good way. (laughs) Um, They are fact-packed, and you'll not remember everything, I doubt at the first reading. So, if you have some time to spare, listen to it again. Or, and this really is a Rolls Royce, you know, find the notes, which are available in two different forms from our website, and then you can do it at your own ledger and see all the verses written out in front of you. Well, thank you for your time. Today, I am thoroughly enjoying these revisits to the Better Covenant and the chance to see all kind of things I wished I'd put in the book, quite honestly. And I hope you are being blessed too. So thank you for being with us today. And we hope to see you, God willing, same place, same time next week for another edition of Broken Bread. Until then, 
Thanks again, and God bless you.